Good morning. My name is Donald Clowder. I am a partner at the law firm of Morgan Lewis and Bacchius in Washington, D.C. We are here today to interview Professor Thomas E. Kuiper. Uh, Professor Kuiper was the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Antitrust Division from 1972 to 1976 and since has been a professor of law at the University of Michigan Law School. Good morning, Tom, and welcome. Could we start by having you tell us a little bit about your background on your path to coming to the Antitrust Division? It was a fairly normal path, I suppose, uh, in the early years. I, uh, I went to Michigan undergraduate school. I went to law school at Michigan. I uh, went on and clerked for Justice Potter Stewart of the Supreme Court. Uh, spent two years in private law practice in Chicago uh, and joined the Michigan Law Faculty in 1964. Um, my break, if you like, and the one which leads me always to say you don't plan careers like this, I came when Bill Rehnquist, who was the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, called a colleague of mine looking for a young uh, faculty member to come as his deputy, and he wanted somebody who could talk about football. Uh, I happened to fit, and uh, that got me to the Justice Department, and from there, uh, I suppose I was just familiar. Uh, I was certainly not well known in the antitrust field. There's a wonderful headline in the London Sunday Times which says, unknown to head antitrust division. So that's how I got there. And you came into the division in July of 1972. 72. I was sworn in on July 1st. Uh, and uh, then I had four years, basically. And that was quite a long tenure to be head of the NBA. Yeah, I, I, I think I remember checking that Thurman Arnold was there slightly longer, not much. In fact, there was some debate as to whether I would stay on long enough to uh, put his tenure to one side. Beat but the I, record, I think yes. he was longer. Um, well, when you arrived at the Antitrust Division, the, uh, the federal government was in the midst of the Watergate investigation and various uh, problems. The, Antitrust Division, I guess, had been touched to some extent with the ITT scandal, yeah. and um, you know, you came uh, certainly after that set of events. How did that period of time in, in working in the Justice Department at that, that time kind of shape your perception of how to do things, and how did it affect the Antitrust Division? Well, my nom first of all, my nomination was held up because of the ITT investigation. Uh, the Justice Department did not want my nomination going ahead at a time when I would perhaps have to get involved in that investigation. So that was ongoing when I got there. Uh, the Watergate break-in, of course, had occurred. It happened on the night of uh, my sister's wedding. Uh, and I was back in Ann Arbor, and my wife has always reminded me that I got up the next morning, there was a little blurb about like this in the Detroit newspaper that said there'd been a break-in at Watergate. I had worked with people like Ehrlichman and Haldeman, and I remember I said to her, and she remembers it vividly, I said, there's going to be a lot more to that than you'd think. Uh, and that turned out to be right. Uh, it took about a year uh, before there was a, rather, a really direct effect on the division, uh, other than the ITT uh, part of the case, that whole investigation. But as a year went by, um, first of all, it became a monumental distraction. Um, attorneys probably were spending as much time reading the newspaper as, as doing their work. Uh, but then it began to interfere in much more direct ways. Uh, we actually had demands for the Nixon tapes uh, as discovery matters in two sets of our cases. In antitrust uh, cases? In antitrust cases. Uh -huh. We had it in the uh, Associated Milk Producers case and in the Networks cases. Uh, in both cases, attorneys had demanded that we produce the Nixon tapes, which was a small problem for the <laughs> antitrust division. Uh, but then as time went on, what the real impact, I think the worst impact, was that the credibility of the Justice Department was put at issue. And it wasn't just in the criminal division. It, it included the antitrust division. Our lawyers would go into court. Judges who had been perfectly prepared to accept representations made by the department uh, no longer wanted to accept them. 
Uh, and the result, I think, was that our attorneys suffered in court. Uh, and, and that's not easy when you're, you're, you know, you're dealing with career people. That's about the last thing they need is to have their credibility questioned time and time again. And then, of course, we ultimately got the Saturday Night Massacre. And, you know, mm -hmm. All kinds of bad <clears throat> things happened. October of 73, you had been there about a year at that point? A yes. over a year. Yeah. Tell, tell us how that uh, Well, I, you know, most of us at the department weren't <clears throat> entirely privy to what was going on behind the scenes. Uh, you will recall there was a special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, uh, who was running the Watergate ITT uh, investigation at that point. Um, ultimately, of course, what had happened was that the White House decided they were going to get rid of him. Uh, Attorney General Richardson uh, refused to do that. Uh, he had the authority to fire him. He refused to do it uh, and was fired that night. Um, it's never been quite clear to me whether the Deputy Attorney General Bill Ruckelshaus fired or managed to resign before he got fired. And it was ultimately Robert Bork uh, that fired uh, Cox. Uh, that whole evening has come to be known as the Saturday Night Massacre. Uh, but for most of us at the department, this was all going on without our knowledge at all. Uh, it had been in the works, we now know, for several days, uh, although Bob Bork didn't know anything about it either uh, until the demand that he fire Cox. But we were at home that Saturday night, and my, I think, about 10-year-old daughter uh, I went to the phone. We were watching a local um, television program called Agronsky and Company. And we had seen somebody literally come right on camera, right across in front of the camera and hand Agronsky a note. And he said, well, we've just gotten information that. And then he repeated that, that Cox had been fired. And at that moment, the phone rang. Uh, and it was Attorney General Richardson. Uh, and that's the first I knew of it. Uh, and then I think it's fair to say that night all hell broke loose. I mean, there was a question, were we all going to go into the department? <clears throat> I had my section chiefs and lots of people calling me. Uh, the oddest one was Henry Peterson, who was the head of the criminal division, had been on his boat in the Chesapeake Bay, didn't, his radio didn't work. <laughs> and he came back to the pier, and there were all these phone messages tacked to the pier. And he called me, and what was, had to be one of the great understatements of all time, he said, before I answer all these phone messages, he said, did something happen tonight? And I said, Henry, you better, better get in. Uh, and then we all met the next day on the question of whether we were all going to quit. And uh, uh, there was a lot of sentiment, I think, among the other remaining assistant attorneys general, save one, uh, that we might all quit. Um, but the career staff, uh, the, the section chiefs, I had a big meeting in, in my office in Washington that Sunday morning. Uh, they all indicated they would quit if I did. And that would have just decimated the division. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would have taken all the career leadership out. So I finally said, OK, I'm going to stay. I have a speech scheduled in Boston on Friday. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'll talk about it in that speech. It was up at the New England Antitrust Institute. And I gave the speech, and I did talk about it. Uh, and we then had the Washington Star, which was then published here, ran a column uh, about a week later saying the president must be pretty weak because one of his appointees went to Boston and called for his resignation. <laughs> and I didn't get fired. Well, that was a little overstatement. Mm -hmm. but, well, what, uh, what did you say in the, in the speech? Well, I basically uh, said this was uh, a, a grave threat to the, to the operations of the Justice Department, uh, that I thought it was inappropriate. I think I used that word, which is, you know, it was, it was a fairly harsh speech. I intended it to be. Uh, and I thought if I get fired, I get fired. I had a standing arrangement with the University of Michigan Law School. If I got fired on a Friday, I was back on the payroll on Monday. So. Uh, it was kind of riskless, I suppose. And then, of course, the whole thing just went on from there, and, and uh, uh, the disruption to the division got worse. Anything that you had to clear through the White House uh, just didn't happen. Mm 
I don't think most people knew how close we were to not having a central government at all mm -hmm. during part of that time. Did you have conversations with, with Bork in, in terms of the whole process? I know you later <laughs> yes. had a role in working with him as... Well, sort of we had, we'd lost the Attorney General. We'd lost uh, the Deputy Attorney General. Bob Bork was the Acting Attorney General. And I was, for all practical purposes, trying to run the office of the Deputy Attorney mm -hmm. General as well as the Antitrust Division. Uh, and Bob and I used to meet up in his office every night. He adamantly refused to move from the Solicitor General's office to the Attorney General's office. Uh, and I, I, a number of evenings he started with the same line or a variation of it, which was, does it occur to you that we have no idea what we're doing? And I said, it's occurring to me every day. Because uh, I was doing things that I, you know, I had no background for. Uh, and that went on for, I've forgotten how long it was, before uh, Bill Saxby came in as Attorney General. Um, well, you, during your tenure, you worked under four Attorneys General? I started under, let's see, it was Kleindienst, and Kleindienst was followed by uh, Richardson, and then we had an acting in Bork, and then I had Bill Saxby, and I ended up with Ed Levy. So if you count Bork, uh, it'd be five. I told the staff to keep our briefing books in loose leaf binders so we didn't have to <laughs> just do anything but change a few pages from time to time. And th this was also a time when, as I recall, the Attorney General had to sign off on every case that the uh, division brought? Uh, yes, that was true. Uh, and uh, I was a little unclear what that was going to mean with Bob Bork. Uh, you know, here was the paradigm of the Chicago School of Antitrust. I thought, oh, good grief. Uh, we were good friends, but that didn't mean he was going to sign off on my cases, but he signed off on everyone. And then when Bill Saxby came in, we finally got rid of that requirement, which went back to uh, the, administra the Roosevelt administration's effort to rein in Thurman Arnold. <laughs> Uh, so after the Saxby period, uh, it was left to the, the discretion of the Assistant Attorney General as to whether a case was important enough that it had to go to the Attorney General. One of the interesting things about your tenure is this was a period of time when very big monopolization cases were, were all over the division, so to speak. You, the IBM case had been filed on the last day of the Johnson administration. It yeah. was still raging on when you uh, came in. And uh, you are uh, the person who brought the AT&T case. Yes. Um, uh, what, was it a burden on the division, or was it a consideration that you had already one of these big cases and you were thinking about going to battle on another during that time period? I, I don't think we really looked at it as, as a, a peculiar resource problem. We, we had an odd situation back in those days uh, that we actually had Congress trying to give us more money than we thought we could spend. I remember a, a, an appropriation hearing where they wanted us to add something like 100 lawyers in a year. I said, I won't do that. I said, I can't do it. I can't hire people that would be any good. Uh, I don't know what I'd do with them. So we were, we were not really short of personnel. It, it did mean at any given moment uh, that there were some things probably that we were not going to do. But uh, we weren't spending a whole lot of time thinking of it in resource terms. Uh, the IBM case uh, really had not been eating up a lot of people uh, when I got there. Uh, as you indicated, it was filed uh, on the last day of the Johnson administration. Uh, that gave it a kind of aura of illegitimacy from the beginning. Uh, Richard McLaren, who came in as Assistant Attorney General, uh, was very angry about the way that was done. Uh, he thought he had been left stuck with this case that he'd had nothing to do with um, and didn't push it. So it was languishing in discovery. There weren't uh, a lot of people involved. And I made the decision, which you know, you look back in hindsight and you say, I probably shouldn't have decided that. I made the decision that uh, we were going to put the case to trial. And um, the choice was either to dismiss it at that point uh, when discovery was maybe a third done, 
uh, or to push ahead and, and get the thing put to trial. Uh, I thought at the time that it was a reasonable case. I think you always have some reluctance in dismissing cases that others have filed. Uh, and so we went ahead. Uh, I think it's interesting that the staff estimate for trial time in that case was six months. <laughs> and of course it was in trial for years. Years and years and years. Uh, and, uh, and it did become a, a, an important resource drain as, as it went on to trial. Uh, the AT&T case, uh, we did a little better planning and had, I think, a better notion of how many people we were going to need uh, and when we were going to need them. Um, to me, from the beginning, the important the moment in that case uh, was going to come on the motion to dismiss. Uh, when the argument was going to be presented that this was all in the exclusive jurisdiction of the Federal Communications Commission. Uh, I thought if we won at that point uh, that it was uh, a case that the division would win. Um, that didn't take a whole lot of manpower to get ready for that. And uh, so it really wasn't until after that uh, that we began, that the division started having to pump more and more people in there, and that was really after I'd left the division. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, it, uh, yes, they're, they're probably two of the biggest Section 2 cases ever, uh, but I, we, we assumed we had the resources to do it. Was the AT&T investigation started when you were in office, or did it, was it started it earlier? It was, you know, I'm really not sure I can answer that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that somebody asked me that not very long ago, and I, uh, I think there had been some preliminary uh, poking around uh, at the urging of MCI. Uh, I came at it in a kind of odd way. Um, I was very disturbed and had for a long time been disturbed uh, by the old 1956 consent decree, uh, which kept AT&T out of all lines of business except telecommunications. Um, I thought that was as anti-competitive as you could get. And indeed, I, I still believe to this day uh, that there might never have been an IBM case if there hadn't been that decree that kept AT&T out of the computer business, among mm -hmm. other things. Uh, and I, to me, as I started to think about it, I thought, well, maybe we can, you know, can we go back and just vacate that decree somehow? But you really couldn't do that without uh, new litigation. Uh, then we had the whole interconnect problem, which was really coming to the fore at that point. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission was having uh, a great deal of difficulty trying to regulate AT&T. Uh, so at that point, we began to really press a full-scale investigation. Um, and uh, it went on fairly quickly at that point. Biggest problem in the investigation was finding economists. Mm -hmm. uh, we really didn't have an economic staff at that point. And all the outside economists we talked to were under contract to Bell Labs. So it was very hard finding economists to work on that case. But it went, it went ahead fairly promptly uh, and uh, committed us to a course that the division had to stick with for a long time. Uh, made a lot of history. Yeah, it did. Uh, there's a big debate, of course, as to whether all that wouldn't have happened without the lawsuit. That is, whether technology wouldn't have overtaken that industry and that, uh, in hindsight, maybe the suit uh, uh, it was either not necessary or really didn't add anything that wouldn't have happened anyway. Uh, I don't think that's true. Uh, the case was really about opening those markets up to innovation. Uh, I think it did that. In fact, if anything, it did it much more rapidly than even we anticipated. Uh, so I think it was an important step in taking telecommunications to where we are now. Well, I think opening up the markets is really the whole question and we are living with the results of that, which are tremendous for the yeah. consumer, and, and that's what it's all yeah. about, ultimately. Yeah.
Um, how quickly after you kind of started in earnest did you actually file a case? And tell us the circumstances of the filing of the case. <laughs> Uh, well, this filing of the case was a little odd, as, as I think you know. Uh, uh, we had, uh, the investigation went for about, uh, probably about 18 months, I would guess. Uh, and we were, we were prepared to file a case. In fact, I had held the filing up at one point, and I'm not sure people do know that. Uh, I had gotten a phone call from Jack Anderson, the Washington Post columnist who said he understood we were preparing a case to break up AT&T. And then he said, now, before you answer any questions I'm going to ask, I want you to know that I have in front of me a draft complaint with X number of paragraphs and a memorandum to the attorney general with X number of pages. Well, he had it cold. Somebody given it to him. And so just out of orneriness, I held the filing up. I thought, no, I'm not even going to push ahead with this. Uh, I'm going to let it sit for a little while. Uh, and, uh, but at any rate, AT&T then asked for a meeting with the Attorney General to present their views. And this was uh, Saxby at the time? This was William Saxby. AT&T at that point was uh, working through their house counsel. And uh, the firm that ultimately handled the case was not involved. Turned out, I didn't know it at the time, that that's what was going to happen. The firm that ultimately handled it was the firm I had been with when I was in private practice. But they weren't on the scene. So I set up a meeting, and I, I went up to see Saxby. And I said, now, this is the purpose of this meeting is to hear them out. They want you to hear their views. Uh, and then we'll get together and talk about the case. And I had sent the fact memo up uh, and the draft complaint. Um, and we were, everybody was assembled in the big conference room up there on the fifth floor of the Justice Department. And Saxby, after everybody was assembled, came in from the back room. And I don't remember his exact words, but the drift of it was very clear. It was something like, Gentlemen, I want you to know we're going to file a complaint to break up AT&T. Well, this wasn't exactly what the meeting was meant to do. Uh, the AT&T people looked absolutely stunned. Uh, Mark Garlinghouse, who was the uh, general counsel, looked like you just hit him across the face with a wet cod, you know. And, <laughs> and uh, I turned to my special assistant that was sitting next to me. I said, what do we, and wrote him a note. I said, well, what do we do now? Uh, because we had just given out what was probably one of the biggest pieces of inside information ever. Uh, and so my uh, special assistant, Keith Clearwaters, uh, got up from the table, went out to the outer room. Uh, he was in communication with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, and he came back with a note that said, well, we either file or we put out a press release saying we're going to file. Uh, and uh, that's what ultimately happened. Uh, but I remember uh, the, the meeting broke up very quickly. I mean, there really wasn't, uh, Saxby was not going to listen to uh, any real argument about this. And so they, the, the, we, we kind of held the, the AT&T people, and uh, I went into the back room with Saxby, and he said to me, well, he said, do you want to file this case or not? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, well, file it. So we did. Um, Don Baker, who was one of the deputies, assistant attorneys general who had been involved in the case uh, very closely, didn't know anything about it. <clears throat> got off a plane in Los Angeles, and there was a big headline that we had filed the case. So uh, it came as a surprise to a lot of people. Uh, it was not the ordinary set of circumstances, but we were ready to file. I mean, the, the papers were all ready. And you, were, you filed that same day? Yeah, we yeah. filed that afternoon. After the filing, was there, uh, what was the reaction, the public reaction to, to the filing? Well, the what case? we discovered is I think about half of the population in the United States held stock in AT&T. Uh, they were all furious. Uh, we had, I think, of about eight standard form letters we were using uh, to respond to all this. 
The other thing we learned, and I, I, I guess I really knew it down deep, but you know, there are an awful lot of people in the public that really don't want to have to make choices. And as time went on, we kept hearing about, I, you know, I like this phone service. I don't want to have to choose between competing carriers. Uh, but that kind of disappeared over time. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the reaction was not strongly positive uh, in the public at large. I think that's pretty clear. Um, and how long was it before the uh, the motion to dismiss was filed? I take it that took some time. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I don't remember exactly when the motion was filed. Uh, and yeah, it took some time. I mean, could, there was a lot of preliminary stuff. And, uh, I I think maybe the, the uh, motion was filed must have been in '75 sometime, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not quite sure when. Um, but once that motion was denied, then of course it was on to trial, <coughs> and uh, um, we ended up, of course, with the settlement, which broke AT&T up. Right, exactly. Well, in addition to IBM and AT&T, from your perspective, what other cases that you filed, and you filed many, many cases, what would you consider the most important or the most interesting? Well, those two don't necessarily go together. <laughs> uh, uh, we had three cases that ultimately ended up in the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. uh, the, profession, the uh, professional engineers case, Southern Motor Carriers, and Gypsum. Uh, those were all significant cases, and they all raised uh, uh, some major questions. Uh, when I look at the price fixing cases we filed, they, they seem puny compared to those that are being filed today. Gypsum was probably the biggest, uh, and we started that down that path that led to a great many asphalt paving cases being filed. Um, there was not much focus at that point, and, and we really didn't have the tools to focus on a lot of the international side of things. We did bring a couple international price fixing cases, but they were, they were difficult back then because uh, you couldn't get cooperation from anybody. Um, but, you know, we were looking. Uh, today, of course, those are the really big cases. Um, those are the ones that come to mind as, as the big cases that had some significance down the road, but there are lots of other little cases. Uh, we indicted a lawyer down in New Mexico who organized a price-fixing agreement among his clients. Uh, uh, just a lot of, of, some of them now that I look back at them, kind of odd cases. Uh, we lost strange cases. Uh, I had a, uh, uh, we brought a, a case charging four service station operators in Jackson Hole, Wyoming with fixing prices. This is not exactly a big case, uh, but they had done it at a meeting uh, where they had invited the uh, federal superintendent of Grand Teton National Park to come uh, and talk about the prospects for the tourist season. And his, in his presence, they fixed prices. And he called us, and I thought, well, you know, he was a good, diligent federal employee. I couldn't not just simply ignore him. And then we lost the case when the judge instructed the jury that if the prices were reasonable, they should acquit. Well, everybody knows that's oh, not the God. law, uh, but there wasn't anything we could do about it. He was a, a homer. So he had lots of odd little things. Um, and... Uh, we also spent a lot of time in, in regulatory stuff, a uh, lot of interventions in, in uh, regulatory proceedings. I thought that was an important thing for us to be doing. Um, so there were lots of odds and ends, and, uh, but AT&T, of course, was the, was the big one. Tell us about your experience with the Norwegian mink uh, cartel, I guess. One of your, uh, yeah, one that of was one of that was one of our our cases involving the trickle down theory of antitrust that the small consumer will ultimately benefit somehow. Uh, we had brought a case charging uh, Canadian and Norwegian mink farmers and sellers with fixing prices. Uh, my wife had a sorority sister who came to a reunion uh, in Ann Arbor. Uh, who was I had on her, I don't know how many husbands, but at any rate, 
she was married and living in Oslo when her husband came home from work one night carrying this document. And apparently his English was not terribly good, and he asked her to translate and explain what it was. And across the top of the page it said, United States of America, and then it went on indictment. And uh, he got up, she said she got all the way down to the bottom of the document, and she said, oh my God, and there was my name. And I had known her very well in college, and we had indeed indicted her husband. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, you know, the, the, the arm of the Justice Department was pretty long, and uh, that, uh, that was one of the few really personal times that uh, something like that happened. Well, that had been one of the longest arm uh, of, of, of the antitrust division at that point in yeah, time. It's obviously yeah, changed since then. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 there had been cases. The old quinine case, for mm -hmm. example, had been brought a number of years before, and one of the named defendants in the quinine case, an individual who was, I believe, Swiss, uh, made the mistake, uh, it was when I was assistant attorney general, of wandering into New York City. Uh, he was going through Kennedy Airport, and he had a long layover. I think he was going to Guatemala or someplace like that. But he had a long layover, so he decided to go into the city. That was a terrible mistake because we got a call from immigration that this fellow had just entered the United States and there was an outstanding warrant on him and an outstanding indictment. We had him arrested. Uh, he spent the night in the New York House of Correction. Had to go in and plead. Uh, so there were cases like that, but not like you see now. During your tenure, and we're in the midst of a period now where the Supreme Court seems to have a renewed interest in antitrust cases, um, but I think the last time they had such an interest or took so many cases was, was during your tenure at, at Justice. Um, well, they certainly had some cases. I mean, this was, this was the time, in fact, the statute was just changing mm -hmm. while I was there, as, as you know. Government civil cases for a long time went by direct appeal to the Supreme Court. So their workload over the previous period of years had included a number of government cases. Uh, but uh, it is true, I think, during the four years I was there that we had, you know, certainly a significant number of cases in the court. Um, well, you had the last of the merger cases. You had General Dynamics, Marine Bank. Yes. False Staff, I guess. False Staff. I argued the False Staff case. <clears throat> In fact, that was a very funny episode. Um, I had arrived at the division, uh, and I hadn't been there very long. And as I recall, I, I cert had already been granted in that case. In fact, I think the government's lead brief had already been filed. Uh, when I came in, and Erwin Griswold, who was then the Solicitor General, called me and said, would I like to argue the case? Well, don't say no to that, although I actually did say no, ultimately, in the General Dynamics case. But um, the record in false staff was manageable. So I said, okay, I'd do it. Uh, <coughs> and um, the afternoon before the oral argument, Griswold called me, said, well, how are you doing? Are you ready? I said, yeah, I think I'm all set to go. And he said, well, he said it won't be any different than any other appellate arguments you've ever made. And there was this long pause, and I said, Erwin, I don't know how to tell you this, but I've never made an appellate argument. Uh, and that provoked a really long pause at the other end, and you could hear the wheels going around thinking, well, what have I done? But it went okay. But we had, yeah, those three cases um, were really the end. You know, you had that funny little Citizen and Southerns thing that came a year later, but not of any consequence. So uh, we really did have the last of the Supreme Court merger cases. Um, these were also cases at the time that uh, very much followed the view of Justice Stewart that the only thing common to these cases is that the government always wins? Yes, well, you know, I, I clerked for Justice Stewart, and I, I was already familiar with his habit of writing these one-liners, you know. <coughs> he always said that his line about pornography, when he said, I, 
can't define it, but I know it when I see it, was going to appear on his tombstone. Uh, <clears throat> and he did it all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he wrote very well, and he used those one-line things. And that line appeared in the Vaughn's Grocery Descent. Now, when he said the only thing consistent with all these cases is the government always wins, which was true up until that point. So when the, we got word the General Dynamics opinion was coming down, uh, and the call came from up uh, on the hill that the opinion was written by Mr. Justice Stewart, I said, well, you know, You're in trouble. We're in big trouble. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, I mean, we lost that case. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and that was really the last merger case, of effectively substantive merger case? Yeah. Well, no. Uh, yes, yes, mm -hmm. General Dynamics, sure, mm -hmm. that's right. Uh, and uh, it's a, a really odd fact that we have not had a merger case since. Uh, I mean, we're talking 30 years, and the law has changed 180 degrees almost, all without the blessing of the Supreme Court. And I don't know if they'll, I don't know if they'll ever take a merger case. There aren't that many cases litigated anymore. Yeah, exactly. So those cases had a significance. And general dynamics, of course, was the one that really opened the door to uh, the changes that we've seen since then. Um, Speaking of those changes, uh, you were instrumental in establishing the Economic Policy Office, which was the first time, I guess, the Antitrust Division really had a uh, full operation that dealt with economic issues. How yeah. did that come about? Well, uh, I suppose it came about in part because coming out of the law school world, uh, and I'd been teaching antitrust, you know, and as I say, I wasn't very old when all this happened, but I had been teaching antitrust for five years. Uh, and I had had some exposure back in college uh, to the whole relationship between economics and, and, and what should have been the way of deciding antitrust cases. So I was kind of taken aback when I arrived at the division and discovered that they, there really were no industrial organization economists there. We had an economic section, but they were largely people who made charts for litigation. I mean, they were more statisticians. And then the practice had been to bring in one outside academic economist, new one every year, as a special assistant to the attorney general, to the assistant attorney general. Well, bringing somebody in for a year really is a pretty useless enterprise. And to have them identified with the front office, I mean, one way to guarantee <clears throat> that the staff was not going to cooperate with an economist was to have him identified with the front office. I mean, there would already be the notion that an economist was going to kill anything. And then to have it listed as part of the front office, well, that was impossible. And so very early on, I made that a priority, was to, to get a group of economists into the division and to do it in a way where <clears throat> there were economists involved in investigations from the very beginning that they were part of the team that was involved uh, when a case, uh, an inquiry began. And I was really blessed because uh, George Hay, who was the special assistant who had been hired, I didn't hire him, he'd already been hired. Uh, he was coming in when I arrived. Turned out to be a wonderful administrator, among other things. And he and I spent a lot of time that year trying to work this out, and then I said, okay, George, now I want you to stay and do it. And he did. And I think, I don't know how many economists we had by the time we left, but it was a large number. Uh, and that's why the division was, for example, able to play a significant role in the whole deregulation uh, struggle that was beginning, uh, particularly with the airlines. We had, by that time, what may have been about the best group of industrial organization economists in town. Uh, so it worked out well, and I think it uh, has, that, that really sort of became the model then for what the FTC did, and now we're seeing it in other parts of the world, uh, and it's just taken as a given, <clears throat> but it was not a given then. Did the fact that you had a separate little organization and it wasn't the front office help to sort of solve the problems <clears throat> with the staff 
Uh, well, I don't know how many problems it solved initially <laughs> or how many it created. Certainly over time. Mm -hmm. um, once they began to work individually uh, with uh, the legal staff on particular matters, uh, it became commonplace. But there was a, there was a resistance. Uh, there was a resistance in some of the old liners to any use of economists at all. Uh, one of the things I did was I decided that uh, the section chiefs and assistant chiefs needed to get a little exposure to uh, what people on the outside, particularly with economics training, thought of the division. <clears throat> so I, created, I called for a kind of retreat and I brought in a couple of economists just to sort of lecture these people and one of them <laughs> was Bill Baxter. Uh, well, Baxter just took the division apart. I mean, he was, uh, there was absolutely nothing the division had ever done historically that uh, he thought worthwhile in, in the way he was putting it. Now, I know, having talked to him later, he was deliberately being provocative. Uh, but it rattled a lot of people. And then, of course, later Bill Baxter comes in as head of the division. And, uh, <coughs> and actually sent a lot of the lawyers into training, economics mm -hmm. training, which was a step I had talked about, but we, I don't think we were quite ready for at that point. Well, I remember when I, when I came to the division and was in, in the operations office, <clears throat> there was a mandatory course taught by George Hay, which you had to yes. sit through once a week for yes. a semester or whatever. Yeah. It's really, really good training. Yeah. Really. Well, you know, it just seemed to, to me from the beginning that the division was just woefully, woefully behind the time when it came to economics, and that that just was unacceptable. Uh, so I think in the long run, it, it greatly improved the quality of decision making. It changed the pattern of cases and so on. Tom, you mentioned the deregulation effort and, and the role of economists in that. How did the whole era of deregulation come about? And I think this was principally the, the later part of your time at the Yes. Uh, well, there had been talk of it uh, during the uh, uh, beginning of the, of the second Nixon administration, but it got lost mm -hmm. uh, in Watergate. And, um, uh, but by the time Gerald Ford became president, which was a great breath of fresh air, uh, there were a number of people around the government that were beginning to push hard uh, on the notion that uh, we really had some rather dramatic overregulation and that it was bringing big inefficiencies in the marketplace. It was causing uh, markets to just not function very well. Uh, and the first target picked was, were airlines. And we had all kinds of airline problems uh, leading up to that. Uh, and so the, the, that was picked as kind of the paradigm. That, that's where this all was going to start. Uh, I think from the very beginning, at least during the Ford years, there was a notion that then you would go on to trucking and railroads, and ultimately into some other things as well, although the, the, the first focus was transportation. Uh, <laughs> and so the program began to try to work out airline deregulation. The Ford administration sent up a comprehensive deregulation bill. Uh, unfortunately, that did not pass. Um, and ultimately, it was legislation sent up by the Carter administration that, that actually accomplished airline deregulation. I say unfortunately because the Carter administration bill uh, left to the uh, Department of Transportation control over airline mergers. Uh, that had been a big battleground uh, in the four years. And I thought we had won that battle. And uh, it was the kind of dismaying, uh, I think, that it went back to transportation. Uh, but um, there was very strong sentiment that airline deregulation uh, uh, would lead to uh, uh, lower pricing, to more flights. Uh, I'm, I'm at this point in my life a little ambivalent about it because I think those of us who were involved 
In fact, I said at a conference this past Monday, I said, I never want to hear a theory of contestable markets again. Uh, things were not anticipated. When the people didn't really anticipate frequent flyer programs, they didn't anticipate the hub system, uh, things which put some rigidity back into the airline market and made it perhaps less competitive than we had hoped. But it did become the model. And then it was on to trucking and railroads. And, and uh, there'd been some, uh, a lot of early discussion about what was going to be done about banking. Uh, communications was lagging a little bit uh, in terms of deregulation. But uh, the, the whole deregulation philosophy, which of course then ultimately just blossomed during the Reagan years, uh, was, was coming onto the table. And uh, that was a significant set of developments. I saw there were comments in the Antitrust Modernization Commission report that came out uh, just a few weeks ago indicating or giving credit to the Ford and Carter administrations as really being the pioneers in making yeah. this happen and urging that there's still a lot to be done out there. Uh, yeah, uh, and I think the Ford people, uh, it really was an interesting pattern that evolved. That, uh, Nixon had created something called the Economic Policy Group that met at the White House every morning. It was chaired by uh, Secretary si Treasury Simon. Uh, and if you had something on the agenda, you know, you'd be invited over and you'd keep out in the outer room there. You were kept uh, waiting until your little item was on the agenda and then you'd be dragged in and dragged back out again. Uh, the day Ford took office, that changed. Literally the day. Simon was still the chairman, but if you had something on the agenda, you just went to the meeting and you could talk about anything. Well, what tended to happen because of that was that this group, which was a lot, you know, there'd be several cabinet people, there'd be other people there, is we started into these rather freewheeling discussions about deregulation in a sense that wasn't just on some formal agenda. Uh, and I think that made a big difference. Uh, the Ford administration was so open and the Nixon administration was so closed, it was like being in two different worlds. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons of why Ford's people were able to, to take deregulation as a, a sort of generic subject and think about it uh, in a number of settings. Who were the drivers in the administration who were responsible uh, for You know, I don't, I don't even, uh, I, I can't even identify particular people. Uh, um, clearly, it, we were one of the drivers. Uh, the Department of Transportation was, was quite prepared to, to push for deregulation as long as they kept control of mergers. Secretary Coleman and I battled over that through a good many meetings. Uh, but it was just a kind of widespread feeling, I think. Certainly Secretary Simon, uh, pretty clearly. Um, so. That's deregulation, and it went on over a long period of time after that. Terrific. Well, we are out of time, and I want to thank you very much for sitting and going through this hopefully not difficult cross-examination, <laughs> uh, but it was good to sort of bring out a number of these issues. I learned a great deal, and, uh, and I know our, our listeners and viewers will learn a great deal as well. So mm -hmm. thank you, Tom. Okay. Thank you very much.